All right, we may be a moment or two uh, late here, trying to get things set up a little bit better. I don't see anyone coming online yet, so I'll wait just a minute and see if anyone's coming on. Um, I will, uh, I'll just mention <clears throat> this weekend is uh, Labor Day weekend and um, um, we've always let our saints off on Labor Day and so we're not having services in the church this week. I know we hadn't had it for a while, but uh, many people had already made plans and so I didn't want to interfere with that. So we went ahead and, and maintained our regular um, time of being off on Labor Day. So God bless all of you. It's good to be, be with you again this evening. Um, I appreciate being back in service and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having it, uh, our regular services at regular times, including Bible studies and, and breakfast on, on Sunday mor mornings. Anyway, God bless all of you. Um, I, um, I wanted to mention here that um, um, I think I want to talk a little bit this evening on the uh, second chapter of the book of Revelation, the first letter that Jesus had John write to the church of Ephesus. So <clears throat> I thought I might would say something about that. Um, before I get into the second chapter, uh, I'm in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. I've been covering things along those lines on Thursday nights. However, <clears throat> I've backed up to maybe address something in the seven letters to the seven churches. Um, but I might read in the first chapter in, uh, let's, let's start in the 19th verse. Uh, I'll start in the 18th because when, Je when John saw him, saw Jesus. He, he fell, he fell like, you know, fell at his feet like he was dead. And, and the Lord laid hands on him and said, fear not, I'm the first and the last. Verse 19 said, he said, I'm he that liveth and was dead. <clears throat> and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So, uh, here Jesus was the first man that he came to this earth, took on the seed of Abraham, became a human being, uh, lived his life, finished the work God sent him to do, overcame his, uh, this, uh, fleshly nature. And, uh, well, uh, and, and inherited a life forevermore, he said. And now he's got the keys for you and I of hell and of death. And so he writes to John in the 19th verse and says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So he's telling him to write things that are right now at the time that he gave him this revelation and also the things that he gave him that would be the future. And verse 20 says, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven gold, <coughs> golden candlesticks, the seven, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So uh, he was he 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 made stars or ministers in prophecy in Bible, and uh, he was writing to the seven um, angels of the seven churches. I remember many years ago when someone talked on this in the in a general meeting in Houston, Texas, 
a young man who was just a visitor got up. He began to talk on and tell that John wrote these letters to angels in heaven. And um, I was fairly new at the body in the body at that time, and I was amazed, you know, how men dealt with things on the floor. Uh, I remember them talking to this young man. They finally had Brother Cornelius Smears get up and talk to him and begin to explain to him that there would be no way to get a letter from here on earth to heaven and that no man would be writing an angel. And they began to explain to him that this is talking about uh, the bishops or the, the senior pastor of those seven churches. Uh, the word angel means messenger in the Bible. And there's, there's earthly messengers, which is the ministry of God. And then there's heavenly messengers angelic beings from third heaven, but there's also uh, messengers down here on earth. And John was writing these letters to these seven churches and to the leading man of those churches who was in charge. And uh, I want you to notice something. He, he, he said, the seven stars are the angels of the churches and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest are the seven churches. You'll notice here later in uh, the first letter to Ephesus that the Lord threatened to remove their candlestick. One of the things I wanted to tell you about that is, is that the candlestick was in the holy place. Uh, of course, this is symbolic prophetically, but the candlestick was in, it was in the holy place and <clears throat> It represents the divine order of God, our second heaven condition. And therefore, this is an emphatic proof that there's no way that this book could have been written in AD 95 or 96, like the Catholic Church maintains through the words of a, a man by the name of F. Uh, uh, Irenaeus and Eusebius. Eusebius got his information from Irenaeus, there was, who was lived about a hundred years before him, and so he got it from some of his writings, or maybe it's a little bit more than that. There, there was a separation about three hundred years, you know, from the time that they got the information, but the church would there would not have been a second heaven condition the church fell away after AD 70. And so therefore the writing of this book would have had to take place before AD 70 for there to be, each one of these churches was in a candlestick. Uh, uh, they were in, a, it's in a type, it's allegorical of course, but they were in a divine order of God in, in the early church before the church fell away. After the church fell away, there was no church in a candlestick uh, setting. And so uh, I think that's something that needs to be uh, truly considered when you consider the writing. Uh, if you go back to the first chapter of the book of Revelation in the very first verse, it says the revelation that God gave uh, Jesus to show unto his servant <clears throat> the things which must shortly come to pass. Uh, what must shortly come to pass was AD 70, and the urgency was to write these churches and try to get these churches uh, that still was in a candlestick condition, still had the seven spirits of God, still was in a lofty place with God and were promised the overcoming life if they would, they, they still, it was still available to them. And so, and in verse three, it said, blessed he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Well, it certainly wasn't at hand later when God began to show the future, like he was telling John here in the 19th verse to write the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. So that uh, these seven letters was, was 
in, they were important to get to these seven churches at this time. Some people say, why was there just seven churches or seven letters were written? Because we know there was more than seven churches in Asia, <clears throat> the Gentile churches. Well, we don't have any scriptural proof to explain that. However, I will tell you that uh, I think it's reasonable to consider that these seven churches were uh, leading churches, you might say mother or pillar churches. And so whatever was written then would go out to all the churches, particularly those other churches throughout Asia that looked to them for leadership. And so <clears throat> uh, the first letter was written here to the the church in Ephesus. So let's read a little bit in it. In first uh, verse of chapter two, it says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So, uh, you know, another thing is seven is a complete, it's the number of, it's, it's a perfect number, the number of completion. And so you would have to think that these seven churches had uh, the connection, possibly the oversight, uh, different ones of different other churches throughout Asia. And so Jesus walked in the midst of all these churches in Asia and these seven in particular, uh, he was with them as their mediator in uh, their uh, lofty place of, of uh, second heaven condition. Here's what he said to him. Verse two, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how, can, how much can, canst not bear them which are evil and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Well, you might ask yourself the question, how? How would the Lord, how, how would these churches, how would they try someone who said they were an apostle and found them liars? Well, you remember John uh, in his letter, I think it's in the fourth chapter in it or is it the third chapter where he said, uh, believe not every spirit for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And uh, he said earlier, said they, they, uh, they were not of us or they would have, they'd still be with us. Well, um, one of the ways, no doubt that they, they, they could try and know whether or not a man was a true apostle was to know whether or not he held the apostles' doctrine, whether or not he knew the truth of the word of God that had been uh, afforded to the people of God, men who were trying to change that, men who were deceiving people and pulling away from the word of the truth. Uh, those churches that uh, were planted properly would not accept that. And so... And, and and not only that, but probably their mode of of uh, attempted leadership. Uh, he goes on here and mentions, uh, and you and has borne and had patience, and for my name's sakes has labored and has not fainted. Remember, these churches were under severe persecution. They, you know, Israel, A.D. seventy was coming, they were being driven out of uh, everywhere. And a lot of severe persecution was taking place. I think sometimes we can learn uh, what to possibly expect later in the end of this world when we get down there. We're not, we're not yet in the end of the world of the Gentile times yet, but we're nearing that. And so we can relate to some of this, or we certainly will be able to in the in the future, not so far away. Nevertheless, he says, I have somewhat against you. Notice he, he tells them, I know your works. I, I, I know your labors. I know your patience. I know how you've 
been faithful to hold to the apostles doctrine and to uh, the words uh, that Jesus gave unto them and how you've borne with uh, all of the trials and, and tests that you've went through and you've had patience waiting on the Lord to, to uh, help you in, with, through every situation and, uh, and labored for his name's sake. That is to build the body of Christ and to help everyone that possibly could be helped and then not to faint under the persecution and the, the severity of, that was taking place at that time. Nevertheless, though, he said, I do have something somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Uh, I've mentioned this to the church here lately, how that uh, I've thought about this some, that how uh, I call it the mechanics of uh the operation of God, learning how to find the proper balance. Uh, you know, every one of us had such a tremendous love of God when we first came to him, first repented of our sins, felt the cleansing, the how, that clean feeling of your sins all washed away and God accepting you into his favor and through faith, the born again experience by receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and um, uh, and then living with that uh, and embracing that closeness that we all felt of God when we first came to him. And, uh, but then we have to begin to, to grow. We have to begin to learn uh, the truths of the word of God. Uh, it's all uh, a learning a experience to us all. And the mechanics of learning the doctrines, learning the order of God, learning uh, the ministry of God, uh, how to uh, get our lives lined up with <clears throat> this operation of God, the body of Jesus Christ, which until we came to him, we were without, and we were without understanding uh, God's, his ways, his purpose. And so it's took and is taking a renewing of our mind. And uh, so I, I'm just saying, and I, I can't put myself in these people's place, but I can't understand how that you can lose your focus on that intimate relationship and maintaining that and keeping that fresh in your life. Uh, at the same time, you're trying to get the understanding of the mechanics of God's order, uh, the doctrines, how to apply all that to life, get it into your behavior, get it into your everyday walk. And uh, so it's easy to get uh, out of focus sometimes and lose that first love. And of course, uh, this, this church in Ephesus had been through such a tremendous ordeal of the persecution and the effects of God's people uh, uh, going through what they went through and the church falling away and having men that were false apostles, false prophets, going through the body, trying to uh, persuade people against uh, the, the apostles' doctrines, and uh, many trying to put people back under the law and uh, phases of it and all kinds of uh, ideology that was taking a place back there. Remember, these apostles were passing off the scene, losing, and John wound up, by the time he wrote this, he was uh, possibly the last apostle living on the earth. And so uh, it was more than he could maintain. It was more than any of them could maintain. Remember what the apostle Paul told the elders at Ephesus. Remember what he told them? He said, you're not gonna see my face anymore, but he said, after my departure, 
grievous wolves will come in spoiling the flock and they're they're going to uh, men of your own selves are going to rise up making disciples of themselves uh, and so he he begins to deal with them about uh, their first love that he wanted them to get back and and get that back in uh, you might say on the front burner he said, verse five says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen uh, and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Of course, that word repent we know means to, to turn and it doesn't mean just to be sorry, but it means to change what you're doing and do it right. Do it, go back and do it the right way. And so, uh, but here, a threat to remove the candlestick. He was actually telling them, you are falling to a point that you're going to lose that second heaven condition. You're not going to have the opportunity of, of continuing your walk into perfection if you don't do some of the things that I'm telling you to do right now. And, um, and then he, he goes on further and says, but this thou hated, thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him do, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Then he says to him that overcometh, will I give, to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Of course, I've taught that the paradise of God, yeah, of course, the Garden of Eden, and I've always used the second chapter of the book of Joel, where Joel's prophesying there, Peter always uh, stated in, on the day of Pentecost, this is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. Joel prophesied of the day of Pentecost. That's what he was talking about. And in the second chapter, he said, they're a strong people. There's never been the like ever before. And he says, there won't be for many generations, which I've always uh, taken as, a, as inspiration that it's talking about us after many generations of the church falling away from the early church, there's going to be another people like those people. That's the body of Christ and the restored church and the end of the Gentile world. But, uh, but um, let's see, what did I want to say about that? Uh, that he's, he's telling that church uh, that, the, that Eden is before them and a desolate wilderness behind them the Garden of Eden or paradise or the restored church or the divine order of God, second heaven condition, all of those uh, phrases of terminology refers to the divine order of God or a second heaven condition. And so uh, he tells them, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Eden was before that church, a desolate wilderness behind them, which was the falling away of the church, the wilderness that we Gentiles have been going through for these near 2,000 years. But God has us in a restoration mode and we're, we're laboring and nearing uh, a restored church. And so, but this church was... Uh, given the promise back there, they still had uh, a, a promise to overcomers and to enter into and maintain second heaven and uh, to eat of the tree of life while they were in the garden or in paradise, in second heaven uh, and obtain eternal life. One of the things he told them was that this thou hast Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, if you look back in history about the Nicolaitans, you, you can find sparse uh, mentions of it, 
but it, it's hard to really uh, lay uh, hold of anything in research that really gives you any definite identifiable definition of, of Nicolaitans. However, the word Nicolaitan means destroyer of the people or victors of the people. And uh, uh, they're also in, in these, these letters, uh, they're, uh, they're linked together with Balaam uh, and uh, uh, men that were 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 uh, false uh, prophets, and of course, being destroyers of the people or victors of the people, uh, it's it's reasonable to consider that one of those the doctrine back there of ruling over or dictating the people. That does destroy God's people. You, you can't make uh, you can't make a servant out of God's people and make them be righteous. You can't force people into righteousness. You cannot uh, dictate people into righteousness. There's a a scripture over in the book of Colossians. I'll mention here. Uh, You'll turn with me to the second, let's see, I believe it's in the third, second chapter of, of uh, Colossians. I've done quite a bit of research on, on this uh, scripture here that, let me first read it to you in the 18th verse of Colossians 2. It's, it's a difficult verse to understand and, and to be able to explain. It says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which the whole body, joint, whole body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. And of course, that the head of the body is Jesus Christ. Well, there's all kinds of things that you'll uh, hear or read about men trying to explain this verse, like, you know, there's a teaching of worshiping angels rather than Jesus Christ or, you know, uh, but it doesn't fit with the context. See, if you go back, and I won't go all the way back, but... Uh, uh, Let's just, um, the, let's go back to the 16th verse. Just take two or three verses here just to give you a little bit of backdrop on the, uh, the context and setting of what Paul's saying. And, uh, in verse 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. If you read the first chapter and the second chapter going down, you'll see that what Paul's dealing with is Judaism. Uh, the, the fact that men were trying to impose the law of God, Judaism, holy days, uh, um, uh, what to eat, not, you know, dietary laws, what to eat, what, what was uh, uh, righteous to eat, what wasn't to eat, the worship of holy days, new moons, or the Sabbath days. Uh, and those things, Paul admitted that they, they were a shadow of things to come. In other words, they did cast a shadow on true righteousness. And that's why they were placed in the law. But here in the 18th verse, where he says, let no man be gouged you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Uh, to have, to be, uh, for us to be humble enough and it to be voluntary on our parts and all the ministry of God has got to allow the saints of God to grow to a place that their humility causes them to voluntarily work underneath 
the ministry that God puts them over. At the same time, the ministry has to be a tender, listen to wisdom from above that James mentions. James mentioned when he said, it's first pure. See, there can't be a motive, a man-made motive in trying to uh, lead God's people. It can't be for a reason of wanting to be somebody, wanting to be people to do what I say, and wanting to be a boss. But remember what Jesus said, that it, it, if we're going to uh, be like him, we're going to have to become a servant. He's the greatest, he that's greatest among you, let him be your servant. And men of God, they need, they've got to learn how to be a servant, to serve people with the counsel of God's will, God's word, uh, the truths of God's word, and the uh, the behavior of their life to counsel them and the righteous behavior. At the same time, you cannot use the fear of man to force people into, they've got to understand that this is a voluntary humility. Let me go back to the 18th verse and, and explain how I'm, how, I'm, how I'm explaining this verse. Don't let anyone beguile you or cause you, deceive you of your reward in a voluntary humility of worshiping of angels or messengers or a ministry. That's, I don't think that, that um, if you go back and research the, the Greek on this, on the wording in this scripture, I don't think that the King James or any uh, of the interpreters were able to really understand what Paul was saying. It would have been better, I think, if it would have said, don't let anyone beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility of, of submitting to a man of God, the men of God, those people are intruding into things that they haven't seen. They're vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind and they're not holding the head. See, if you want to hold the head properly, if you want the head, the, Jesus Christ, to be the head of your life, he's delegated authority. He's, he's delegated authority to a ministry. That doesn't make the ministry the boss. It doesn't make them like the Nicolaitans to run people's lives and dictate to them, but rather to train them up, rather to be an example to them of, of having patience. Again, as James said, let me, let me, matter of fact, let me just turn there right quick and read. Let's, let's read what, how James said it, just in case I don't quote it exactly. Uh, it's in the third chapter of James in the 17th verse where it says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. I said, our intent, if we're going to be wise men of God as ministers, we have to have a pure motive. Our motive cannot be self. Uh, it can't build up self. It can't be covetousness for us to covet uh, or love, you know, being in charge of running people's lives. Or, But we have to have the, the, the pure motive of trying to help every saint from the least to the greatest with the counsel of God's word and the behavior, how to work the behavior of righteousness in your life without demanding it. See, as long as somebody has to make you be righteous or make you obey the word of God, as long as someone has to make you do that, you're a child. And if men are not careful, they will keep people children and never let them grow up but people are to grow up to a fullness of age. They don't need too much tutoring once they get to a certain age. And to be first pure, then peaceable. See, our, our, 
our helping God's children develop, it's got to be in a peaceful way. It can't be in a mean or, or you know, antagonizing way. It's just the same way that Paul said, Don't, fathers, provoke not your children. Well, it's the same way pastors aren't to provoke the saints of God and belittle them or, or cause them to fear man, fear man's authority outside of the fact that it's God working through that man. Men have to be patient for that to work. Gentle, easy to be entreated. See, I'd, I'd hate to be a man that people would say, it's just hard to work with that man. That's just, that you know, it's hard. That man's so rough that it's not easy to, to, for that man to lead you or do anything. I, I wouldn't want that. I don't want, I don't want that. And I, I'll have to admit as a minister that I'm having to work. I'm continually working on getting these things in my life full of mercy. See, God's been so merciful to me. It's just hard for me not to want to be merciful to God's children. He's been so merciful to me. In fact, there's been times I've thought, why do you even put up with me? Have you ever been that way? Well, sometimes I feel that way. I have at least in the past. And full of mercy and full of good fruits. Without partiality. Men of God are not to be partial. You ever been around parents that had to favor a child? I'm telling you, that's a horrible thing to put children through when children may know that my mother or my father has another child that's their favorite. Parents should never, ever show favoritism among their children. And ministers should never show favoritism among saints. Full of, uh, without any partiality and without hypocrisy without, you know, trying to be something that you're not, trying to pretend that you're something, trying to put forth something, that you're someone that you're not. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So <clears throat> just getting back to uh, Revelations, this letter, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a pretty short letter, but Jesus it was something that was going to keep Ephesus. It was going to keep Ephesus. It's going to cause them to lose their candlestick place with God if they didn't heed what the Lord was telling them. Isn't that something that the Lord would have this man write these letters? And that's all I'm going to go over tonight is this one letter uh, to, in Ephesus. He recognized all the good they did, but the one thing he was he was wanting them to repent of and get back to work on, and that was their first love. And I've mentioned that here recently to the church. I, I feel like that we all need to work on our intimacy of keeping that closeness that we want to please him, that we want his, uh, his presence in our life on a daily basis, that we want to share our lives with him and feel enriched by his spirit, his word, uh, the, the, the cleanliness of God's presence, his covering over you. Uh, Brother Shane says, it's better to err on the side of showing too much mercy or err on the side of not showing enough mercy. That's true to a certain extent. But we also can be guilty if we're out of balance. Uh, uh, what God wants is a true balance. We're, you know, but I will agree until we get to a restored church, we, we, we have far greater danger of not showing enough mercy than we do of, of uh, showing too much, that's for sure. And so we have to work on that part of it, of being, being merciful, easy to be entreated, tender, uh, the making sure that our motives are right. Again, I'm 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 mentioning uh, the 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 deeds of the Nicolaitans. 
the deeds, the things that they do uh, that, that conquer people, rule people, dictate to people. It's, uh, I think it's reasonable to consider that. If you do some research on the, the Nicolaitans, that's, that's about as close as you can get to coming up with uh, uh, a definition of explaining them and using, and, and actually it all boils down to self. See, if you, even if you link them up with Balaam, the things that Balaam did was for self. He was selfish. That's why... I still hold to Brother Leniger's teaching on pride. I don't think you can be proud of nothing. Pride is selfishness. That's what it is. And he taught us to be thankful, not to be proud. And when you learn that, I, after he taught that, I can't ever, I just, I just can't use that term at all. I can't say I'm proud of nothing. I just have to say I'm thankful because it just don't feel right. Once I understand what pride is in the Bible, you can't, you can't find where, where pride is something good. Uh, God hates a proud and haughty spirit, but he's close to those that are humble. Uh, and so uh, I'm, uh, I'm just looking at this letter to this, this church. And, and even though he brings up the Nicolaitans there, they, and he's rewarding them are uh, commending them to the fact that they hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which he does too. But the thing that he got on to them about first was their first love. And uh, our first love it, it just first comes into, number one, the Spirit of God. Don't you just love it when the Spirit of God deals with your life, when you've been in services or wherever you are, and the Spirit of God overshadows you, and God touches you, and you know God has taken time out to deal with you personally. And the feeling, the, the feeling of love, how did uh, Paul mention it? in Romans that we're, uh, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. There's just not another feeling of God's spirit to uh, just come down over us, just cover us, and God to personally deal with us. Whether it's in forgiveness, whether it's in our early beginnings of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or God just dealing with us, whatever we're going through in life. And uh, I think we're living in a time and in a world where it's easy to get out of focus and lose that first love. And I, I don't want, before the restored church gets here, I don't want to have lost my first love. So I'd like to be able to uh, work on that and keep my first love, keep it rich. And uh, I think it's something we should all work on right now. Uh, anyway, I'm using this first letter to uh, the church at Ephesus. And uh, I, I think that that love will even become greater as the church is restored and Jesus gets closer to all of us, um, you know, and, so I'm looking to I'm looking to the Lord to help us even get closer to him and his closeness, his spirit. Don't you know God, when the Lord is ready and people really get closer to him and remember what I said about the, this verse in 2 Colossians verse 18 that... Uh, to this voluntary humility of holding the head through his ordained delegated ministry. And I've used it many times to say, you know, if you're working for a large corporation and the CEO or chief executive officer of that corporation, you may not be very close to him. Aren't you glad our CEO, 
our head of the body, we can be close to him <clears throat> and have a personal relationship with him. But yet he still delegates authority for us to walk with down here on this earth in our everyday affairs in the body of Christ. And so uh, we want to, I, I want to, somebody told me today, a minister gave me some good thoughts today and uh, was telling me, you know, men who lead the body, men who have trouble, it's always rebellion. It's always rebelling against authority. And those men, they'll leave, but they never, ever are able to accomplish anything because if they can't work with authority, they, you know, they can gather some people that are rebellious. They can't work under authority either, but they can't stick together. They can never build anything because they can't hold anything together because no one is sensitive enough to realize that, that there needs to be a unity in working under the proper authority. And of course, when the rebellion's involved, nothing's proper about that. So God bless your hearts. I, I just want to encourage you today to, to let's all work on our first love. Let's all work on renewing that that first walk that we had with the Lord. Now we can't stay in that place, you know, because when we first started walking with the Lord, there was so much we didn't know and we had to get these other things in there, but learning how to balance it, that's what I'm saying. Uh, let's try to get it, uh, work on it where we can bring it, bring it into balance. If we've got that part of it out of focus, We've got to get it all working in the proper balance. But I know with God's help, we, we can. I know God can help us. And I think we should work on some of these things. If that's something that uh, we're trying to have a restored church, and if that was something that was going to cause the church, uh, a, a church to lose its divine order, our second heaven condition. We're trying to get back there. We're going to have to work on that to have that if we're going to have a restored church. So I want to encourage you that way. Some of you uh, theologians, maybe you can help me study and encourage the people of God in that direction. You uh, saints in the Little Rock Church, God bless you all. I'm looking forward to being with you again Sunday morning at 1130. Uh, I had one of the sisters tell me that I, I'm thinking we might could have Bible study and a breakfast here pretty soon on a Sunday because I think the families could sit together. I think there's enough room in the dining room that we could have proper separation. Um, I think whoever's in charge of breakfast could possibly just have a light breakfast, like breakfast burritos, um, maybe uh, oatmeal, uh, and uh, it could be prepared probably almost in the home and, and set out the next morning. We could also have maybe donuts and, and of course, coffee and, and maybe even cereal. But anyway, I think we can work on it. Some of you sisters in that area help Sister Sherry Boyd to figure that out for us, and we'll see if we can get that back in our operation here real soon. I won't be with you this Sunday, so I, I, I almost forgot that, but I will a week from this Sunday, and you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. God bless your hearts. I love every one of you. Um, remember Sister Gail Ratliff? She had surgery on her hand uh, yesterday. She's in pain, but she did come through the surgery all right. She's doing okay us all keep her in her prayers that God would touch her and help her to with her pain. Uh, remember those that are in need in our church and remember the Dominican Republic. That work over there certainly needs our prayers and uh, we're trying to get things worked out for them. Brother Quick wants us to pray for his mom, Elizabeth Quick, so she needs her prayers. 
Remember Brother Chuck Millsap's wife, Bernice, uh, Sister Bernice, the family, the church there in Wichita. He was a, a great right-hand man to Brother Green, one of his, his right-hand men there, elders. And uh, so that church had a great loss, at least Brother Millsap. Uh, pray for Sister Smith. She's having some problem with her sciatic nerve, but uh, she's seeing a chiropractor. Had two or three treatments this week, and seems like she's doing some better, but keep her in your prayers. Uh, remember my son and his wife, Michael and Cindy uh, Smith. They're setting on ready to go to Dallas to uh, see that new band, grand baby born. Uh, but he's being stubborn about getting uh, getting here. Uh, he's past due. So pray for Sister Brittany, Andrew and Brittany Smith and Dallas Church. Pray for them that God would help her uh, to have a natural birth and, and for it to be easy on her and uh, that God would be with her during this time. Pray for those in our church. The Craftons have been sick. Sister... Wilson's been sick. Brother Ray and Susan Weaver needs our prayers. Brother Shelby Weaver needs our prayers. Uh, remember Sister Abraham. Sister Brenda Ratliff needs our prayers too. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, Brother uh, Fide in Guatemala, he's on watching tonight. And he's been talking to me and he wants us to pray for Guatemala and uh, the labor that he's doing over there. Also, we have a work, Brother William, in uh, Puerto Rico. We've got a work there that we're trying to get on its, uh, off of its feet. And so pray for Puerto Rico. Uh, as I said, remember these other missionary works in, in Haiti, Africa, uh, the Philippines, uh, Honduras, India, my Lord, God's reaching out and touching so many different areas. And uh, we want to remember them, especially during this time. Uh, so pray for, pray for the body of Jesus Christ and all, and also pray for our leaders of our country and our countries. Uh, during this time of this pandemic, we don't exactly, you know, we, we don't have the answers yet. Our leaders are still looking for the answers. There's still a lot of people dying. There's a lot of people getting this virus. And, uh, you know, I, I know that it's, it's just a, there's a lot of confusion about it. And But our medical professionals uh, pray that God would help us, help our country, give us a little more time. Uh, pray for the this election that's it's coming up. Uh, I'm not, I don't get involved with politics, but I am praying for our country. I'm praying for God to help us, for God to give us, us Christians, give us a little more time uh, that maybe we can operate and uh, maybe you can help us and lead us to get a little closer to this restored church before uh, too much evil, too much further or greater evil happens to uh, uh, get more and more involved. And so let's, let's, we've got so much that we need to pray for. Remember us all. Remember these needs that we've mentioned. God bless you all. Uh, pray for me and I'm going to pray for you. And uh, looking forward to seeing you again. The people in the Dominican Republic that are listening, I'm working on uh, having a online live Bible study once a week, week with all of you with uh, an interpreter with so that you all can understand exactly what I'm teaching. I'm wanting to get with y'all and and uh, cover some things right now that I think is pertinent for the Dominican Republic. So pray for that. We're, we're right on the verge of getting that started. So God bless you all. Have a good evening. I love you. Have a good evening. Good night.